Hi right, fellas, welcome back. So you might have seen the other day I bought a Sapphire Cosworth and one thing I had to do before I buy it was ring Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Once he finished laughing at me car, he, uh, he just gave us a bit of advice and I thought, well, why not come down? We'll speak to Paul about buying a Cosworth because to me, there's no better person to ask if you're in the market for a Cosworth, especially a 500. So Paul, tell us about what you look for personally because you buy, buy and sell a lot of Cosworths at the minute, don't you? Yeah. The thing is, these are old cars now, aren't they? They're they all 30-odd year old, so <laughs> really, you, you, you're looking at everything. Everything? Yeah, rot, obviously, uh -huh. the biggest thing with a 30-year-old Ford. Crash damage? Yeah, crash damage uh -huh. and originality, really, because uh -huh. obviously people are asking big money now for these cars, uh -huh. and some people are asking big money for cars that aren't exactly what they seem. That's no. the thing, and there's, unfortunately, a lot of people ring me after they've bought them, I've bought this car, what do you think? And then you have to give them the bad news, you know, that uh -huh. it hasn't got its original engine in it or this. And some people aren't bothered, you know, uh -huh. some people just buy them, they like to drive them about, which is fine. But I think when you're paying the kind of money that you are now for what, for top-end cars, you, you need to make sure they're right. You know, you bought your SAF as a project car, mm -hmm. so basically as long as it's all there, you were happy. Uh, you I know, knew right? what I was buying. Yeah, you, you knew you are buying a project car, but... When you're talking cars like this and, uh, you know, this sort of calibre, yeah, the investment cars, you need to make sure they're right. Uh -huh. And I've seen a lot of people very upset when you tell them it isn't what it's meant to be, so. If you're in the market for 500 as well, it, just get in touch with Paul. Um, you've got a full catalogue of information on every RS500 out there, Paul. Yeah, I've got the original um, Tickford build lists, mm -hmm. handwritten one, so I can tell you whether it's got the, what we call a matching numbers car, because with your standard three doors and your sapphires, it's easy to tell because obviously on the, on the logbook you've got an engine number. So you just look at the engine number and see if it's the engine that's in the car. Mm -hmm. So they're easy. The trouble with the 500s is a lot of people don't realise that these were standard three door Cosies that came off the production line. They were never cut, you know, they didn't come out of the Genk factory as an RS500. So as I said, they left as a standard three-door, were then transported to Northamptonshire, where Tickford was. They were put in a compound, and Tickford did the conversions to make them RS500s. Right. So they took the original engine out, which obviously that number is on the logbook, because that's as it left the factory, the logbook is already completed, all its details are on it. Tickford took the original three-door Cosy engine out and put the RS500 engine in with a different engine number, right? but they never changed the logbook. So the engine number on an RS500 logbook is not the engine number that should be in the car. So people, so it's sort of well, fairly well known is that now. People are, you know, with the internet now, it's, it's a lot easier than it used to be. So people ring me and say, Paul, can you tell me what the engine number should be for this, for this RS500? So I look at my build sheets, which tells me the, red, the VIN number of the car, uh -huh. the build number, uh -huh. And then it gives me the YBD number, which is the engine, specific engine number for the engine that Tickford put in. So I can tell them what the engine number should be to make this car what we class as a matching numbers car. Because right. even though it's the wrong engine, it's still classed as matching if it's got its original engine that Tickford put in it. Right. Uh -huh. The engine number's in a different place as well. Well, all right. So it makes it even harder because on <clears throat> all your three-door sapphires, it's on the block starting uh -huh. to the side. Well, on an RS500, we can show you one. There's a, oh, there's, a, an en there's a race car engine over here, but it still has the number on. So if you look there, above the water pump, you can see there, look, YBD and then three numbers. So that is a genuine RS500 engine with an engine number that was stamped on by Cosworth. Cosworth put the numbers on the engines and then obviously they were just delivered to Tickford in, in huge batches. You know, they were there were just pallets of engines delivered to Tickford and Tickford basically just went out into compound, got the next car, the nearest one, uh -huh. drove it in, put it into the assembly line, which I'll give you some pictures because I've got some original Tickford right, uh, definitely. Um, factory, what we call factory pictures, so you can see all cars lined up. So they weren't brought in in any particular order. So that makes it even more complicated for 500s because everybody thinks that the first chassis number is number one. Well, that's not the case, they're all random. Because obviously, right. as they just pulled them in off the off the just however they were parked. Yeah, wherever they were parked, they pulled it in, grabbed the next engine that was on a pallet, put that engine in, and then somebody, as it went off the line, 
logged the chassis number, logged the engine number that was in it, and wrote a build list. Oh, mad. So it, it can be quite confusing, because uh -huh. people say, well, how come that's chassis number four, but it's build number 21? Uh, because it was just whichever car the guy walked out with a bunch of keys, probably, and went, oh, that one, and got in it and <laughs> pulled it into the factory. So, yeah, you've got to be very careful with an RS500 to check that number. Right. So there's nothing on where it would be normally stamped for a three-door Cosworth? Some, some engines do have part of the chassis number stamped into the block, right? but not all of them. So the only 100% way is that number there. Right. And basically you, can, you can't check it against the logbook, because I've said the logbook's got the wrong number on it. Uh -huh. um, so the only way really to check is to probably give me a message or a call and say, yeah, right Paul, for you. I've, got, I've looked at this RS500, it's chassis number so-and-so, can you tell me what the engine number should be? And I can look at the build list and tell them what that engine number should be for that chassis number. And that'll determine what we call a, a matching numbers car. See, so if anyone, not anyone would know that and certainly wouldn't have the information to check it themselves, would they? No, and um, you know, what most people look for is the RS500 has a, what they call a small car plug block. Uh -huh, the which again, we can, block. Well, I'll pull this out a bit so we can see. Come here. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a dog. <laughs> Adam's very masculine dog. <laughs> <laughs> that one with my dog. <laughs> so there's actually three blocks for Cosworth, isn't the point? There's a 205. That's right. Which there's people th classes like the weaker block. Yeah, the early three door and the early sapphires. Then there's the 200 block, which is in well, the four wheel drive cars. If we go back a bit, because it'll sort of explain how it happened, really. <clears throat> the early 205 block was a big corporal block. Uh -huh. Ford tested that engine under extreme pressures and realised it, it couldn't take the big horsepower they needed to run the RS500 touring cars at. It was weak. So they then developed the RS500 205 block. And this is where people get confused because there's the 205 standard Cosworth block, uh -huh. then there's the 205 RS500 block. The only way to tell the difference with them visually is the core plugs. If you look at the size of them core plugs there, they're smaller. They're really small in comparison to a standard, maybe twice the size of that is, is a 205 non RS500 block. Right. And the reason to put the smaller core plugs in again is to strengthen the block. There's other little differences like the, there's a lug there that you'll see on a standard block. There's a little lug cut out there. Uh, proud, sat proud with a hole in it. Well, that had to be cut off on an RS500 because the alternator was sat on a drop bracket to lower the alternator because of the huge T4 turbo. It, it hit the alternator, right. so they had to cut that lug off. They machined it off to allow the alternator to sit lower. But you know that's very difficult to sort of see. But uh -huh. the car plugs is the way forward. And then we have what you said is the 200 block. Well, the Ford realised that when they went to four-wheel drive, there'd be extra pressures on the engine because the engine was four-wheel drive. It was uh -huh. a lot more stressed. So what they did, they took all the characteristics of this block, the RS500 205 block, and basically recast that and but called it the 200 block. But then for some reason went back to the bigger car plugs. The bigger car plugs, but it's still got the thicker walls and everything. So it's basically a very similar block. These have still got some very slight differences, thicker webbings and that, because it's a motorsport block. But in regards to strength for use for power, you, a 200 block is, is just as good really as, right. as, a, as, a, as an RS500. So really the 200 block is a, two, is a RS500 block as such, but just gone back to the bigger car the plugs. The bigger car plugs. Can so. we have a look underneath that car and just yeah. have a look at the differences there? Yeah. So this is a site most people don't get to see, Paul, the underside of uh, Sierra Cosworth. No, no, they don't, no. Now, obviously the, the RS500, again, there's so many myths and stories about this is different, that's different, and, and you tend to see a lot of them when you see the auction houses got these cars in and they do a, a, quite a detailed listing. And I think what's happened is back in the day, early days, somebody's got it wrong and all they do is Google it copy and paste what they see. So you see the same myths come up time after time after time. So basically, to make it simple, the RS500 underneath is a standard three-door Cosworth. Right. All the brakes, suspension, running gear is absolutely 
standard three door Cosworth. Three -door Cosworth. <coughs> the the only box tunnel, everything, every <coughs> no like modifications whatsoever, apart from one. The only difference you'll hear people say something they never can really quite pinpoint it, but they've heard about the rear suspension is different to do with some brackets. There, the brackets, <laughs> and they're quite crude because, as you can see. I should have maybe got a torch. Um, I don't see, I think it, I don't see that. Oh good, it's just, it, all it is, is a box bracket that is simply bolted on. All oh, they did was, to, yeah, they took that, well, bolted and welded. Uh -huh. well, what they did, well. they took that bolt out on the assembly line at Tickford, slid the bracket on, put the bolt back in to hold it in place, and then crudely put a tack weld on there with the MIG welder. And that is it. That's that, all they did. That is all they did. So that would, that's one good thing to look at to see if it's a genuine 500 you know because ah. pe pe you know i've heard it all the time people say well I look underneath but i couldn't find these brackets that you were talking about because it's quite difficult uh -huh. to see it Wait, because the exhaust sides most of it i think you can see probably better from this side with a bit better light if you don't know what you're looking for as well you wouldn't be, it doesn't stand out does exactly it? yeah it just looks like part of the beam but obviously the standard three door beam just finishes there uh -huh. so that bracket was was simply a homologation requirement because when they went to the touring cars they, they wanted the suspension to be adjustable mm -hmm. and they needed to be able to move the suspension so to homologate the race cars the particular suspension they wanted to run meant they wanted to move that pickup point further forward by what are we 900 mil something uh, like that inches, uh. yeah Oh uh, yeah, you know what four inches I know is. What it, I, I'm good in inches. <laughs> so they've had to move that. So basically, that's the only reason that bracket's there. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't add strength. All that is was a homologation. And we can probably see it better uh -huh. if we look at this car, Adam. Right, so this is obviously a group here. This is a group A car. Well, you can see, obviously, that right. is incorporated in a group A rear beam. Um, and it's basically to allow this arm to have a rose joint in moved further forward so it's in line with the other joint to ah, that side so right. it brings them parallel you see because what that does it allows the arm at the rear to move up and down like that uh-huh if you've got one joint out of line it lifts like that that's what the see because the same what is a bump steer they call it on a Cosworth? That's when on the front, yeah. Right. You get bump steer, but that, this is the same principle really. It's just simply so the arm goes up and down like that rather than like that. Right. So that's the only reason that bracket was put on. That makes sense as well, looking at it now, so it's in line. Well, you're an engineer, aren't you? So you understand principles of, uh -huh. uh, of pivot points and everything like that. And, and obviously, because you know, the, the rose joint is immaterial really to the placement of it, but that's there obviously to allow to adjust other angles. But yeah, that is, going back to the road car, underneath the 500, that is the only, only difference. difference. I've seen listings for cars for sale, not, not just auction houses, but everywhere. Different brakes, you know, different uh -huh. suspension, different, and you're like, nope, <laughs> absolutely him. nothing is different at all. Uh -huh. You know, if you start looking even at the front end where all the big changes are, to the untrained eye looking underneath that, there's nothing obvious different to a standard no, three door Cosworth. Same as mine. It looks the same. When you know what you're looking for, you can see the bigger intercooler uh -huh. and different positioning of certain things, but that just looks exactly the same as a two wheel drive Sapphire. Or okay, a standard sapphire, three aye, Cosworth, aye. anything? So no, no differences at all. Same exhaust. Game exactly, box. yeah, everything. Diffs. Everything. There is a difference to the shell that did actually trim the battery tray, didn't there? Yeah, I'll show you that. Can yeah. we drop that down and yeah. show people? Because that's one thing I always remember from those back in the day, people yeah. used to see it. Battery tray has been cut. Tray's been but I think people thought half of the battery tray is missing, you know, so they <laughs> look at a, what might be a genuine 500 and go, that doesn't look like it's been cut to me, but when we show you, it's such a small amount. You watch your send little dog. Come on. Lexi. Don't want you to take you home looking like a pancake. <laughs> God, she's all right. Right, so this obviously is a genuine RS500. So the battery tray that we all talk about is nothing more it's very difficult to see because the loom is oh, in the way very little line, isn't it? can you see there it's just that very small little corner has been chopped off 
It's hardly anything. I was expecting more than that. Than exactly. I, I think I think people expect it to be cut off like here. Uh -huh. So when they look at a standard 500, they can't really see what it is. The movies only took not even way well, less than an inch. Yeah. And the only reason they did that is because you can see that the second fuel wheel fitted to an RS500 is quite close. Uh -huh. It still it, wouldn't it, catch though, would it? No, I don't think it would. I think they did it just as a precaution, uh -huh. really. So they cut that off just simply because that other fuel wheel. I, I think, if, in all honesty, it was probably when they put the first engine in, because they'll have dropped the engine in at an angle, I would think that fuel wheel probably hit that corner oh, as they put the engine in and then dropped it in. So they've thought, oh, we better cut that. So that was crudely cut off with a hacksaw. So they're all slightly different. Yeah, yeah. And but and and, the, and if you look at the edge, they're always rusty because they, they never even them. touched them in. They just they basically got an hacksaw and went right somewhere at their cut corner <laughs> off. And, in, and that's another thing you'll notice, or I've noticed over the years. So obviously there was quite a few guys working at Tickford at the time, and they had I think five or six lines of cars all getting done at the same time. So no two, are, are, I say no two, most of them you'll see very, very slight differences uh -huh. on original cars that have never been touched. You'll see like routing of hoses, slightly different, routing of the wiring loom, slightly, slightly, slightly different, different because you might run your loom that way, uh -huh. I might tuck it under that. So when you look at different 500s, you'll say, well, that loom runs a different way because it's just however that mechanic at the time did it. So there is slight variance. Uh, but that's mad, that mind. That's interesting. But this is where all the big changes are. Uh -huh. Well, this is the main difference, isn't it? The engine, the injectors, the bigger turbo. To, to, make, to make it simpler, it's easier to list what it isn't changed <laughs> right. on a 500. Right. And then really, the only things that are the same is obviously everything from there back the bulkhead back, the wiper, that's all the same. Uh -huh. Your power steering tank, your washer, your header tank, bottle, battery and coil are all the same. But basically everything else is completely different. Completely different. The engine obviously we've discussed is a thicker wall block, so the engine's different. <clears throat> As you said, they run the eight injector um, inlet manifold, so that's different. Even the map sensor bracket had to be modified to move the map sensor further back right. to miss the throttle. Oh, right, uh -huh. If you look here, the idle valve comes out of the side of an 8 injector manifold. Oh, On the three right, door, right. it comes out the front. So they, they had to make a special bracket for the 500 to move the map sensor out of the way. Obviously, tw uh, different fuel regulator because it's got um, an extra takeoff to feed that injector rail. Uh -huh. The turbo obviously is the big T4 turbo, which I think everybody knows a little uh -huh. bit about. Different, unique turbo damper on an RS500, the shoe horse, um, horseshoe one that everybody sort of knows. The airbox. I was going to say the airbox is different. Yeah, that's basically what happened there is obviously they, they, they raised that. If you look at a standard three door, that slopes down. Uh -huh. They raised that to get more volume of air inside the airbox and made the intake there 76 millimeter ID. Again, for the bigger boost hoses so that you could get more air out of the airbox into the turbo so again bigger hoses which were unique to the RS500 they were all special bigger 76 mil bigger on, on the lower one there and same on the the throttle body side again the 76 mil you see there the crossover pipe uh -huh. which is again unique to a 500 because the um, obviously they recirculated that to feed straight into the inlet side which oh, is different uh -huh. there's what we call the snorkel there which is a different intake to feed air into the air box they made that bigger and it's a lot wider so we can take more, more air, in. air in the thermostat's different as well isn't it Paul? it is yeah that again was crossed over to the four before they, they made the water system on an rs500 a lot a lot more efficient and a lot bigger capacity so the radiator is the same size uh -huh. but you'll see here you've got the um, return from the radiator into the engine on this side and then the outlet on that side as on a standard two-wheel drive you just see one coming out so it's completely configured different it's a lot better more efficient water system on the RS. does it hold much more water not a lot more water it's more how it works right. in fairness rather than the volume of water but it's a lot more efficient system amazing even down to the heat shields different uh-huh 
a lot more solid and robust heat shield because bigger temperatures from the bigger turbo. Obviously the intercooler which everybody says I've got an RS500 intercooler. Yeah, mind you, Saf's got an RS500 <laughs> intercooler as well, so these I'm obviously, there. Yeah, these came as in, uh, standard with the big front mount big intercooler, that, and that's cooler. where that came from. You know, everybody wanted a 500 intercooler. So basically, everything under the bonnet, people think it's just the inlet manifold and the turbo. Every hose is different. The engine's completely different. There's a lot more than what people first think. Uh -huh. So again, if you're looking to buy one, it, it, it's quite important that all these bits are still there. Especially for originality and your ACL value and everything, exactly. isn't it? Exactly, yeah. There's yeah. also a difference as look on the outside, isn't there? Can we drop there the is. bonnet and show yeah, people? Yeah, we can. So on the outside, Paul, we've got quite a few differences as well, haven't we? There is. I mean, obviously the first one is the pinstripe. Uh -huh. That was fitted at Tickford. Another myth that there's a different colour stripe on different cars. What, it's like the white cars are different to the black cars, exactly. etc. It's exactly the same stripe, right. the same colour, but in fairness, it does look a completely different colour for some reason on a white car. Does it? It looks a lot darker, look darker. than it does on the perfect example is a moonstone out there. It looks a lot brighter silver, but it isn't. It's the same the stripe one. fitted to them all. So that was just a, a cosmetic thing, really. One thing I found quite interesting when we're down the NAC, someone mentioned it. They're not actually straight. No, the other. They're, they're kind terrible. of the way of about no. as they have fitted them. Well, I mean, I've seen some of them, and you think <laughs> that must have been a Friday afternoon or a Saturday overtime when he's had a good Friday <laughs> evening because some of them are absolutely horrendous. They're really, really bad, but don't be put off if you look at a 500 pinstripes like that because. Even the best ones, when you get down and look close, you see they're a bit... A bit wavy. They're, they're very difficult to put on. I'd imagine they are. Very I'd imagine difficult. they are. Because years ago, working in a, in a body shop, you always put a pinstripe on in one go. Uh -huh. So you would touch it at the front, you would go all the way to the back of the car, and you would get on down, and you'd close one eye like you do, and then you'd find centre line at the car, and then you'd just go... And of course, it was perfectly straight. Uh -huh. These were put on in sections. Oh, with the three bits. Mm. So that's why you get a door that goes like that and then a wing that goes like that. <laughs> and another crude thing, if you look very, very closely, you can always tell an original paint on an RS500 because they trimmed. If you look, the, the pinstripe doesn't go all the way to the end of the panels. Oh, right, uh-huh. And on some of them, depending on how rough they are, you can see the Stanley knife mark. Can you read it? They haven't cut through the paint, but you can see well, they've just scratched a it. very slight mark in the paint where they've cut them all with the Stanley knife. So I've caught loads of people out before, this is original paint, this, and you look closer. I don't think it is. You must upset a few people when they tell you about the RS500. <laughs> well, if they don't want to know, they shouldn't ask, exactly. shouldn't they? You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that, that is obviously just one of the minor units, but the, the biggest thing I think that the 500 is, is more famous for, it's got to be the front bumper the and the bumpers. rear spoilers. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'm guilty as well because I've put all the kit on mine, so mine looks like a 500, which was common, wasn't it? It was yeah. like common back in the day. Well, yeah, I mean, Ford did a, did a new batch of these bumpers, I'm trying to think when it was, it'll have been late 90s, I think, and there was 650 quid. For a bumper? For a brand new bumper from Ford. So the, more now. You know, and the, and the splitters were, I think, 200 odd quid a side, so for basically a thousand pound, you could put a brand new 500 front bumper on your three door cosy, which wasn't ridiculous. Uh -huh. But obviously now we're prices as they are. So yeah, we right mentioned now. the splitter. The first thing is obviously, is, is the splitter that comes right up the side. Um, and it's obviously got a, a bigger lip on it than the original rubber standard three door. And again, that was a homologation item for downforce for the original touring cars. So uh -huh. that was developed for that. And obviously what most people think is, they notice is that there. The cutout for there. The cutout, the which you can see probably. There's a good example out there because there's a 500 sat next to a standard three door, three door cosy, and you can clearly see the cutout stands oh, out you when you when you see the two together. This is different as well, isn't it? The the width of the. It the is the, no, not. You see a lot of people have made a stand, made a standard three door bumper try and look like a 500, and they've carefully cut that out and they've fiberglassed it and stand back and go. Nobody will know. <laughs> and then there's a smart ass comes along and says, yeah, if, again, well, if you look at that three door on the 500, that, clearly. that clearly sees it. The cutout on a three door finishes there. This, this comes out wider uh -huh. and it finishes there. 
on the 500 they made this shorter oh right uh -huh. and this cut out here is roughly th th about three inches wider so you get six inches more air intake on an RS500 bumper than you do on a standard three-door car. I've never noticed that before, the ridge plate. Yeah, it's narrower. Oh, mm. I have never noticed that. Yeah, I think maybe just, you know, cosmetics to line up with it that. Does I don't know. Mm. It does I look better, right? It does look better. But yeah, not many people realise that, that the wider there, so you're getting more air in there, you're getting more air in here, you know, a lot more than you do on a standard three-door bumper. And you've got the added grills on a three-door, they would have been fog lights, wouldn't they? That's right, well, these actually, these again were fitted, um, for the touring cars to get more air in so you could put the duct in at the back to cool the brakes uh -huh. so these had to have them as well but when you bought a 500 they were, these were fitted to the car but you got the fog lights in the boot in the boot in boxes uh -huh. um, so you will see some 500s with the fog lights still in because uh -huh. some people you know oh, i want my fog lights uh -huh. so they put the fog lights back in and sold these to somebody for 50 quid you know and now the 500 <laughs> quid or a thousand <laughs> quid but, money, but most 500s have got them in because it's something that easily identifies yeah. it really so so that's the front front end it's at the back wall as you hold them one of the biggest differences there the, the rs500 yeah, top I'm, spoiler I'm one of the most valuable ones isn't it the one yeah. everybody wants isn't it I know. yeah what they did with the fa again for downforce for the race cars uh, the standard three door doesn't have this extra lip on it just comes and finishes flat they call this the gurney flap. The gurney flap. Where on earth they got that? It's some German thing, I would assume. I don't know where they got that name from. But yeah, so basically you get that extra, what, inch and a half mm -hmm. lip. Which just for downforce. Just for downforce, down yeah. And that's moulded into the spoiler. It's not uh -huh. an addition. So this is a, a, a new spoiler made just for the RS500. And then obviously you get the, the lower one, which again was originally taken from a sierra 1.6 is right which was like quite a rare car not made for very long but it, they did it in three door and four door right but i think the two door was more for the european market so we don't see many of them we don't see many two liter is anyway or si's whatever they call them they're very rare but they had this spoiler fitted as standard and what they did people think they just cut that with a Stanley knife at Tickford to fit it on. But round here for the yeah, low spoiler. But they didn't. No. It's a proper Top molded spoiler. spoiler. It's got its own part number, hasn't it? Exactly, yeah. It's the same part number with a C on the end. C on the end, which is for cutout. Uh -huh. and, and that is part of the moulding on the bump on the spoiler. So it isn't cut with again a myth, a five hundred oh. myth that was cut with a Stanley knife. No, they're not. So that Visually on the outside is the, main the only difference. Is, the yeah. only difference. Yeah. And obviously the badge on the back. Sorry, yeah. Now there's something interesting as well because you tend to see it, notice it more on a black car than you do on any other colour. But the Sierra and the Cosworth was the original sticker, because they're stickers, uh -huh. vinyl, that was on the three door Cosy when it left the factory. And all they did at Tickford was peel the RS off there the big RS, they peeled that off and stuck that on. Really? That's what they did. Now if you look at a, I'm giving trade secrets away here, <laughs> you really notice it on a black car, but if you look at the Sierra and the Cosworth, because that's the original, the RS500 is very, very slightly brighter silver than the other two stickers. Right. Because obviously they were manufactured somewhere else. Different times. Yeah. So it's very slightly different. Really? But the great thing with that is you can tell straight away if the boot lid's ever been painted. Because <laughs> if the stickers are all matched, you know, you know at some time it's been repainted. And obviously the reproduction kits are all made by the same at the same time. Uh -huh. So the stickers are all the same colour. Uh -huh. But, you, but when you, it's one of them great things that once you've noticed it, you, you can't help but look it. at every black right. or every 500 you see, you're looking straight away. Oh, look, it's original. It's original. Yeah. <laughs> Do you do that every time you see one? As well? I do, do I can't know? help it, yeah. Uh -huh. I can't. It's just nice, isn't it? You know, know, that you think, uh -huh. well, that's got original paint on it and that. But yeah, other than that, mate, absolutely. Can we talk standard. about the inside? Because there's a bit of a myth with, um, yeah. like, plaques, isn't there? There is, yeah. Now, um, I'll just I'll get, I've got some plaques in here. Right. I'll, I'll show you the plaques right. first, and then we'll show you where they should be positioned. I always assumed, when I was younger, that all came with a plaque between 
the light switch, the lights, the window, the window switches. switches. That's correct. There's so many times you see an RS500 for sale on internet and somebody, that's not a genuine 500, it hasn't got a bill plaque. Uh -huh. Well, we'll show that car in a minute. That car hasn't got one because they never left Tickford with a bill plaque. The bill plaques were originally done by um, the first registrar, RS500 registrar for the Ford RS Owners Club. Right. Now he had access to the build list, same as, as I've got, and he decided it'd be a nice touch to have a build plaque. Can I one of those? You can. So that, that's one of the original ones made by the first RS500 registrar. Now you can feel on that, it's metal. It's uh -huh. actually brass. It's good quality. It is. Uh -huh. uh, so they were brass and then I don't know what, whether they were screen printed or whatever, I don't know the process. But they were then coated black and then obviously engraved to show the, the vehicle, the, 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 the brass behind the uh -huh. black. So obviously as years have gone by, people tend to want a bill plaque for a car because I think because of that myth that a 500 should have one, everybody wants one, just so that when they go to a show, somebody doesn't accuse them of having a replica. <laughs> so they're the very, very early ones. And when I became registrar, I got a lot of people asking me, I need a bill plaque for my car. And they're good, they're nice, but they're quite difficult to see and they go quite tatty. Some uh, of them were really, that really that tatty. I think the, the, the brass is oxidizing and that, and they look really tatty. Old. So I spoke to Dave Lee at XYZ Fabrications and said, Dave, can, we, can you do me some bill plaques? I wanted to keep them the same size, uh, the same layout, because uh -huh. obviously so they all look the same, but what we decided was to go for the white. Um, I'll cover that chassis number up because it's not my car, but it will have been at one point. All these are cars I've owned that I've had bill plaques made for, or two of You've them You've owned made. all those cars there, I've had, plaques? Yeah, I've had 50, just over 50 or something. <laughs> Great, yeah, I? So yeah, so I, I spoke to Dave and he said, yeah, yeah, we can do that for you. So Dave had them remade for me and, and went to the white background. Just to make it stand yeah, out Yeah, it just pops a little bit, you know, because in all fairness, it's something people like to look for. Uh -huh. They look through the window and, and you can't read it, you can't see it, so with the white, it just makes it pop a little uh, bit better. No, they're so, nice, they're nice. So uh, the myth is, no, they never had them from factory. This is something added later on. And see. other than that, um, the interior is exactly absolutely the exactly the same. Seats, no dash, everything. everything. No differences no. whatsoever. Amazing. So it was basically mainly the engine compartment uh -huh. and the bumpers and spoilers that are your, your main differences, really. And, a, and the V arm. And the prices. And the <laughs> yeah, yeah. Double the well, show sure, window switches so, so people know where these plaques go. I think most people know anyway, don't they? Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's. <laughs> Where you tend, I'm covering the chassis number up because it's uh -huh. obviously not my car, but that's where the bill plaque sits when you see them in the cars. So this is beautiful inside. This one, mind. I wish my seats were as nice as this. Yeah, it's nice. It's a low mileage car, is this? So it's uh, no, it's really nice. It's pretty nice. Can we show people, Paul, where to look for corrosion? Yeah, of course. On a we'll start with under bonnet, right? It'd be easy to knock cars down. I guess this, this is something you always check for when you. Buying a car and selling cars and... Yeah, and, and the good thing is with the, with the corrosion points, it doesn't really matter whether it's a standard 3 or a 500, a SAF 2, a four-wheel drive, an Escort, Cosy, they, they all tend to rot in the same places. Uh -huh. It's the same <coughs> floor pan fitting much, isn't it? Yeah. The, the worst, one of the worst things um, tended to be, not with the Escort Cosies this though, but with all the other series, is round here. Uh -huh. Round behind the water bottle. For some reason, where the water gets trapped under that bottle, but r look around there, they're usually really bad. Or you can see signs of repairs before where they've been mm -hmm. plated. Look for the original spot wells that you can see there. You can see every spot weld all the way around. You can see the original sealer. Uh -huh. but it's quite rough. Uh -huh. People forget, done at factory, it wasn't done to look pretty. Um, so check around there. Um, up here on the on this year, as you see them starting to blister behind right. that sealer there. It's quite bad. That side doesn't tend to suffer anywhere near. Really? No, it always tends to be that side, but it's always still worth having a look uh -huh, around the turrets there and, and you know down where it meets the bulkhead. The, the chassis at the front don't corrode. You never see a, I've never seen a rotten chassis at the front, uh -huh. never, just there. The other thing to look for if, you, if you're 
looking for a car, an high value car, and you're worried about original panels, is look for the original sealer there that you can see that real nice square finished uh -huh. beady sealer. You can see all the original spot wells there. Um, Compared to the other side as well. Exactly. If, you, if you've got two different sealers, you, not necessarily it's had a panel because these sealers are known for cracking. Right. So sometimes a car will have had the sealer changed, but yeah, it's original panels. You so know, they've so had the wing off. Exactly. But the easiest way is there. You can see a, an 86 date stamp there, look, on the wing. Uh -huh. Very difficult. This is easy to see because this is an, a low mileage original paint car. So you can clearly see the, the, the spot wells easy. You can see them numbers easy. But obviously if a car has been painted, it's very difficult to see them numbers because they get filled with get paint. Filled in. But look for original spot wells. <clears throat> that sort of tends to be it really, luckily, on the front end of any of the Sierras. We'll send it up and uh -huh. we'll show you the worst bits on the back, up underneath. Right, so the underside, Paul. Obviously visually check everywhere you can, huh? but they corrode quite badly on this seam here where the, the floor pan meets that structural panel there for the, well, what we call the jacking point, which isn't a jacking point, that's the jacking point there that this car sat on. Uh -huh. But this, there, they corrode quite bad there, so you see them patched up there. A lot of them get crushed in as well, don't they? That's what makes them corrode. What happens is people jack them up there, as you can see this one has been, uh -huh. but luckily not too many times. Um, and it pushes it up, splits the sealer, ah. the water gets in, and that's Blood why out. they're always rotten here. So you get two problems, you get the crushed jacking point and you get a rotten floor. They're remaking these parts now, aren't they? Some shoes, someone's remaking them. Yeah, you can, yeah. Express panels do a beautiful repair panel for that, really heavy gauge, high quality. Uh -huh. So if, if you buy one that is rotten there, you can buy that repair panel, which is nice. Do you know what I heard someone do as well? They welded some box section in. Yeah, to strengthen it. Ah, so you jack, I don't know it doesn't. But why jack it up there? Because it's not right. a jacking point, right. you know. Exactly. But look uh, across the inner sills. I mean, we're looking at a, not a good example to show corrosion because this is mint. But you look across all the edges of the inner sills. Again, with, especially on the three doors and the escort cosies. The sills on escort cosies absolutely rotted away. Really? Two to three years old. <clears throat> the problem with that was it was... These aren't too bad because you can see here the water can get out. Uh -huh. got a little water gap. So they don't really cause too much problems on the three door. But on the Escort Cosy, <clears throat> if you look at the side skirts, they join, they, they mount onto this onto the floor here. Then they do that and come round. Right. And basically the side skirt fills up with mud and grime. Uh... Then when it rains, the mud absorbs the water and then it just rots the sills out. Uh, Air Scott Cozzies are horrendous. Nightmare for it. Let me just turn that off. Aye. So yeah, Air Scott's is, is more, more of an issue on, on sills than any of the others, although uh -huh. obviously the, the Sierras are older, so check for it, but Escorts is absolutely imperative. Because luckily they're screwed on of the side skirt, so if you can get it up on a lift, take the screws out and just drop the side skirt, you'll and usually find half of the sill comes with it. Oh. Um, the rear, maybe look that side where the light is, uh -huh. they corrode badly, quite bad here on the three doors and the sapphires. Um, you'll see them being patched up or needing work there. The worst part on, on any of the Sierras is the chassis, chassis rails layer, uh, the chassis rails. And it's quite difficult to see because it's hidden by this big chunk of rear beam, but the, the chassis rails here, when I was breaking causes all the time, you take them two bolts out and it used to just, just and it'd take out the, away. all the chassis leg would come with it. Really? They were really, really, really bad for it. And that is, it's treble skinned as well there. So the water gets stuck between the three layers right. and, just, and splits it all. So the, the worst thing is, it takes a long time to corrode, but when it does, it's, not it, it's very difficult to fix it because you've got to take up, get back to the original layer, weld that, then put your second layer in, weld that, then put your outer skin on. So it's quite a complex repair Job. if the chassis is gone. Again, this car is mint, but, so it's not a good example to show you, but that is the worst place on any cause we uh -huh. to check is, is get a torch, have a right to good poke about and, and check there. <clears throat> the chassis wheels here aren't too bad. No. It just tends to be there. The bottom bit. Um, the this, this seam here where the floor pan meets, they corrode really bad there. Uh -huh. You see them starting to split and swell there. That's a bad place for them. And the chassis rails also, which is difficult to see there because of the fuel tank, but you'll see there the chassis rails in two pieces. 
So the main part of the chassis rail stops there, then the last part of the leg is spot welded over the top. So you've got a, a double skin of about three, four inches there. Right. They corrode really bad there. The water gets in again, separates and corrodes the back chassis rails. Is that all work you fix as well? If someone was looking at a car and it needed some rear chassis legs, is there something you would do for someone? Oh yeah, you, you can fix anything. Uh, that's what I was going to say, everything's fixable, Every, isn't it? Everything is fixable. It's all down to... Budget and... Well, the value of the... Uh, whether it's viable, really. Uh -huh. You know, if you've got a, a £5,000 car and there's 10 grand's worth of welding, uh -huh. you don't bother. The, no. the, the lucky thing now is... You don't see many cosies getting broke anymore because the values have gone up. Uh -huh. But it also means, like you have with your car, Adam, you can buy <clears throat> a lower end value car and spend quite a bit of money on it, bringing it up to scratch, and you aren't losing a lot of money. You no. know, you can spend five, six, seven grand on a car, and you end up the car's still worth what you what the commitment you put in it money wise. So, so they are worth doing. But yeah, <clears throat> anything is fixable as long as it's sort of a viable repair uh -huh. really but and be careful as well because a lot of people just hide hide like if it's got a hole someone might just stick a bit fiberglass in and paint it black and there's a lot of cowboys out there isn't always there? be aware when you go and look at a car and you look underneath and it's been freshly undersailed uh -huh. and they've got the tins of that what call shuts body shuts this stuff mm. Oh, that's actual gra um, gravity X is that, but... Um, I like the tar type stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean. That. It's like a thick, a thick black gunk. Un gunk that they put on with a sh shuts gun, they call it. And you stand there for about 20 minutes going, mm, and just basically you can put it on half an inch thick. Just cover everything. And it covers everything, and people have... That will put know, me off buying a car for saying that, mind. It, it's quite a, obvious to see, you know, uh -huh. if, even if the car's not particularly mint on its body, but you look underneath and you see fresh under sale everywhere, there's usually, uh -huh. it, well, unless they can say to you, well, I've had all the welding done, look, there's all the photographs, there's the invoices, uh -huh. and then they put a coat of black shuts on top to protect it, that's fine, but if they haven't got invoices or photographs, <laughs> you, need bit to, of a, bit of a red you need a big screwdriver with you and give it a good talk <laughs> about. Um, but that, that's really it, to be uh -huh. fair, they're not, no, they're they're not, not too, too bad. For the old Ford as well, for the age, they, they seem to be hauled up pretty well. Yeah, they do, to be fair. You never really, I mean, you do see odd one with corrosion starting in these seams here, but right. it's incredibly rare, to mm -hmm. be fair. It just tends to be the points we've highlighted. Other than that, they don't suffer too bad. No. Obviously, accident damage. But again, like we said at the, on the front with the spot weld, look for original spot welds, original date stamps, same at the rear, you know, lift the tailgate, look for original spot welds and original sealer down your joints, your uh -huh. back panel. Most of these cars have had a panel on them now. I was going to say, well, they were cheap at one point and people, people like myself, when you're 20 year old and you, you've got decent money, you buy a cosy, you go thrash it around all weekend, bounce it up a curb. Well, fix it the weekend, then you were back out, and it was yeah, yeah, it's yeah. what they were used for back in the day, isn't it? And the other thing is as well, what we what people always forget, and I tell everybody this, all the Cosworth range went through a period where they were absolutely worthless. Uh -huh. During the late eighties, well, no, early nineties, were early to mid nineties. Every car thief in the world was stealing a Cosworth every single night. You couldn't insure a Cosworth. Uh -huh. You could buy a, I remember the days, you could buy a Sapphire Cosy that was maybe five or six year old for two and a half grand. Right. Because it was five grand to insure uh -huh. it, which you say to a kid today, five grand to insure a car, and he goes, well, that's not bad. But in <laughs> 1990, five grand was, you know. Fortunes. Yeah, a lot of money. So these cars didn't hold a great value then. They were, they were almost worthless. Uh -huh. So th the difference today is if you had a bump in your Cosy and you've creased your wing, You'll find that specialist bloke that'll spend a long time and he'll beat all the dent out and he'll shrink it and he'll beat it and file it and make that wing look perfect because you want to keep the original wing. Mm -hmm. But we forget when these cars were two and a half grand, like you say, you'd go out on a weekend, you'd mess about on a roundabout, you'd stuff it into a roundabout. You either braid it out and rammed it full of filler right. or you went to local motor factors and bought a rear quarter for 150 quid grafted it in at home because it, it didn't make any difference no, to the car's matter. value that you'd put a new quarter on it or a new wing on it and that in turn is what's making the original panels cars valuable because uh -huh. they're rare. rare you know but i'm not too put off if a car's 
add a wing on it. If it's been no. fitted correctly, the gaps are nice and you can see the inner wings or the beer end straight and it's not been clouted really hard. I'd, I'd, you know, uh, we have to be a little bit much. forgiving, don't we? Uh, They're 30 odd years old now. But and it's all reflected in the price as well at the end of the day, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. If you want a top notch car with original panels, never been painted, low money, then you're going to have to pay big money. Mega, mega big money. Like a car like this, for instance, is, 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 is big, <laughs> big money. Big, big money. Big money. Yeah. Especially in white. Oh, you're right, Lexi. I thought you farted <laughs> early. <'cause they're> going, <laughs> Everyone will be going, which one are you two farted? <laughs> but. Paul, can we just quickly show people the chassis numbers? Because there's a bit of a myth with them being stamped up, down, do you know what I mean? And uh, just explain what I look for over there. I think, uh, yeah, you've touched on a good subject there because I think the Cosy was one of the most stolen and ringed <laughs> cars in its day. So not only was it uh, another myth with the 500s, but it's definitely worth looking at a chassis number and a rounder chassis number on any Cosy you to buy. To know what to look for. Yeah. If you can, it'd be great to, to get the car up in the air if you can. As you can see here, you can clearly see that that's all the original sealer. You know, it's not been tampered with. There's no differential in the way the sealer's done. No. So we know that is absolutely 100% original. 100% original. But um, this car, again, is low mileage and that, so it's easy to see. If obviously, if you can see underneath the car and you can see any differentiating how the sealer is there that's a big let's investigate a little uh -huh. bit further another red flag something's been tampered with we'll have a look from top uh -huh. because as you said there is a myth with the 500s uh, a myth that i've actually seen two blokes at a show fighting really i had to separate <laughs> two blokes at a show at northampton years ago there was one was saying if it was stamped down it was a reshell. The lad whose car he was looking at got quite upset because his car wasn't a reshell. And they were they were they were attacking <laughs> each other and I had to pull them apart. Right, so the floor numbers, Paul. We've put a bit of tape over haven't we, Paul, just because this yeah. is now a car, so we don't want to show it's the not, full chassis number. Exactly, it's not up to us to no. be showing. Now there is another big, big myth with 500s and for some reason it only tends to be the RS 500s that have suffered with this myth right there's a myth that all chassis numbers should be stamped from the underside upwards right and that if it's stamped any other way i.e down then the car's been reshelled right that's probably the biggest load of i've ever heard in my life but which way are they stamped both both they are stamped both ways a hundred percent we right. are, we got when I was a registrar with the Aris Owners Club, it took a lot of years to prove this and we ended up having to go back to the factory at Genk that stamped these cars from new and, and asking them why some are stamped up and some are down. And they told us why. Now, you see loads of sapphires stamped up and down. Uh -huh. Nobody bats an eyelid. You see three doors stamped up and down. Nobody bats an eyelid. If anybody sees an RS500 stamped down, they all run a mile. It's been reshelled. Well, that's not the case. Saying that, if it has been reshelled, the chances are it will be stamped down. Because just for ease? Because the only people that had the stamps to stamp them reverse was the factory. Right. So if a body shop restamped it, we had no option but to stamp down. But there's an easier way to tell. If you look at this, this is a perfect example of an original factory one because it is stamped up, which means that is 100% genuine. Now you'll see there a little star. Can you get the that in there, Paul, and just show up here. You can see there, there's a star uh -huh. before the numbers start. Uh -huh. There's obviously one after as well, but we won't show that because it reveals the number. So basically, whether it's stamped up or it's stamped down, if there's a little star, before and after the chassis number, that's a genuine Ford stamped number. Right, and it's not painted over the chassis number, is it? It's primer. Exactly, you should see the primer like it is there. You uh -huh. should be able to see the Dove Grey primer on all the models as well. Right. All the same, so if you see it's been painted, not necessarily it means it's been reshelled, it means somebody's painted the floor pans for whatever reason at some point. So if it's a restored car, don't be alarmed, right. but if it's not a restored car, why has it been painted over? Uh -huh. So, um, up or down isn't a major issue, as long as the stars are there. 
So all the models are all up and all down. And I'll quickly go into why that was. When the chassis numbers were stamped in at Ford, this is what Genk told us at the factory. It was done with like a real big G clamp, if you will. It right. went round the sill and it stamped the number in. And it was like a hydraulic press with big springs in it. So the guy who was stamping the number in, the car would come down the, the assembly line with a, a sheet on it and it would tell him the chassis number. He would get all the numbers ready and all the letters ready and he'd put them in this machine, he'd move it round and bang, he'd stamp the number. Every time he stamped it, after so many, the springs started to get weaker and weaker. Now this again revealed to us an, another great thing was we'd noticed that some stamps were real high Right. And some were shallower and you were like so why are some real prominent and some not so as the springs got weaker it oh, stamped shallower. them shallower and shallower so the guy stamping the numbers in would look and go it's getting to limit now so we would stop stamping and what they used to do is put new springs in the machine uh -huh. but while they were doing that the production line doesn't stop so some passed without being stamped Somebody, that guy, would put a sticker on the car so that at the end, if you had a, I don't know what the sticker was, let's say a red dot they stuck on the car, the inspector at the end would know if it's got a red dot on it, the chassis number hasn't been stamped in. So it would go into another line, like a, a snag line, if you will, uh -huh. where any defects were rectified, and somebody would manually stamp the number in the floor. Get away. That's exactly the reason how it was done. And this made complete sense because when you look at the build list that we had, <clears throat> there was never a fragmented way of doing it. It would be, you'd have 10 cars all stamped up, uh -huh. then you'd have five stamped down, then you'd have 23 stamped up, then you'd have seven stamped down. <laughs> and we were like, how come it's such... You know, there isn't one here and one there and uh -huh. two here. It was always quite high numbers. Uh, it blocks. It, a block of up and then a block of down. But there was always a lower block of down than there was up. So it would prove that that theory was correct because obviously it was there quite happily stamping away. And it, but he might get 10 in a run, he might get 12, he might get 15. But when you go to the stamp downs, it was always roughly about the same of four or five. So obviously the time it took them to, to, to did what they ever did with the machine, only four or five cars passed the passed line nearly every time. So when, when you hear that story and you look at the evidence, it, it just all of a uh, sudden you think, sense. for years and years people have been arguing uh. why these are stamped up and stamped down. And there's always a simple an explanation. Uh. Of course, in this day and age, that would never happen because robots uh, and machines are so precise now that they would never let that happen, you know. And we all, like, the, like we spoke about the engine number issues, you wouldn't be allowed to do that in today's world. A manufacturer wouldn't be able to sell a brand new car with the wrong engine number on the logbook, <laughs> you know, because you have to comply with BS, what, and FI, uh, this, and means everything has to be 100%. Back in the 80s, different world wasn't it and a, a company like Ford had a lot of power you know no uh -huh. governing body could tell Ford what they could and couldn't do they employed millions of people they could do basically what they wanted uh, um, so that's the simple that's reason interesting that mind the that's, that's, a, that's an interesting little fact that mind so don't panic if it's stamped down or it's stamped up just look for the little stars if it's got the little stars you know it's a factory stamp if it's been reshelled at any time in its life It'll have the chassis number, it has to be stamped down because uh -huh. nobody's got the reverse stamps other than Ford. So it will be stamped down, but it won't have the little stars. Little stars. Or you'll see somebody's done it with a screwdriver or something, tried to make, a, <laughs> make it look like a star. You know, it just doesn't look right, do you uh -huh. know what I mean? Um, but obviously, without being here for days, there are other ways to tell if a car's been reshelled. But I think that's... A story for another day. Another I think day. We could be quite here for quite a while <laughs> going around all that. But, but yeah, it, it was a massive, massive issue 10 years ago. But now it's just not an issue. Everybody that knows, knows now. Uh -huh. It's not a problem. Oh, cool. That's interesting, that mind. I, I never it? knew that. Right, Paul, before we finish, right, mm -hmm. I've got a couple of questions wrote down. How many RS500s were actually built? 
There was exactly 500. Exactly 500. Because yeah. some say more, don't they? I've heard all all the myths. Yeah, some say there was more. Some say there was less. There was exactly 500. I'll tell you the difference in colours and numbers. There was 56 white ones, uh -huh. which includes the four original prototypes. Right. Then there was 52 made in Moonstone Blue and 392 made in black, right. which made a total of 500. Did they all have sunroofs? Yes, they did. Every, obviously, apart from race cars, all the road cars came with yeah, sunroofs. Every, every production RS500 genuine car had a sunroof. Had a sunroof. Were they all right hand drive? Uh, yes, mate, they were. No I've left heard, hand drive cars? No, I've heard that as well. I've seen some advertised on the internet, genuine RS500 and it's left hand drive. So no, <laughs> def definitely all right hand drive. Did any of them get converted to two run cars? Not that we know of. Right. Logic says definitely not, because basically, um, obviously, the only thing you would actually use would be the bumpers and spoilers, the body shell, and the engine. Uh huh. Ninety-nine point nine nine percent of genuine touring cars, everything was purchased from Ford Motorsport. So you bought a proper motorsport shell without a sunroof and then you built the car up with all group A parts. It would just would not make any sense whatsoever to try and build one of them touring cars out of a road car. No. So as far as we're aware, no, none were ever converted. Right, that's it fellas. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found it useful. And again, a massive thanks to Paul for taking the time out of his day to show us around and just put the knowledge out there and put some of the myths to rest surrounding the RS 500s. If you're in the market for a 500, I would Get in touch with Paul, he's probably knows cars that aren't actually for sale, that, that sorry, that are listed for sale, that maybe could be for sale. I'm sure you've got plenty of contacts Yeah, the, 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 you'd be surprised now how many actually get sold under the radar. Uh -huh. like, well, this car is, is a perfect example. This I've never car. seen this on Facebook Marketplace, no. mind. No, <laughs> <laughs> no a, a, lot, a lot of the owners now that decide to sell, I already have people lined up that contact me and say if this kind of car comes up will you let me know uh -huh. so it's worth getting in touch if you're looking for one because i know of quite a few i'll leave all of paul's contact information below but yeah again mate thanks for having us down and thanks welcome. for taking the time out of your day it's nice to put some of the myths to bed at i know last, i know they might get a few more in the comments now but <laughs> we'll address them yeah but uh, yet again fellas thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and i'll catch you on the next one spot on mate